From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Okay, well, the fix is in. The world's most high-ticket art is part of a global business with tons of secrecy and a laughably small amount of toothless regulation. It makes it a great place to hide money if you're trying to avoid the tax ban or if you got a lot of dirty cash in need of a good scrub. A pretty cool guy named Noriel Rubini, uh, economist and NYU professor, comes into play. What I love about this guy, Matt, he's got a street name which not mm. all professional economists do. His street name is Dr. Doom because he, <laughs> he made a lot of very dire, incredibly accurate predictions about the housing crisis and financial crash of the early 2000s. So oh. people call him Dr. Doom. I wonder what he's saying about the housing market right now. Uh, hmm. Doom and gloom, maybe. Who knows? I don't want to look. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what he shows us is how one person, an individual, can purchase a really expensive piece of art worth, let's say, a million dollars, and they can pay cash, and there's no need for them to register the transaction because there's uh, – uh, because, well, in some cases, you could get around it, basically, and there's virtually no tie to the financial system when a transaction like that occurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't need a lot of paperwork involved in this. You know what I mean? Uh, the opaque nature of the art industry also makes it a haven for tax evasion. And lucrative pieces of art are exchanged all the time, but not in the way you might think. Because the artwork might never physically change hands. It can be stored at these things called free ports for an unlimited amount of time. And quick explanation, I think for uh, some of us in the crowd who might not know what free ports are. But may I have seen the movie Tenet. Yes, I was going to say Tenet <laughs> is where I think a lot of, a lot of folks get hip to it. Um, don't feel bad if you, if you haven't seen Tenet or you don't know what free ports are because the truth of the matter is that there are a ton of people who would prefer that you never actually think about these things. So essentially, like, you know, it, depending on where you live, folks, you probably have some kind of public storage business in your neck of the global woods and you know you know what it is it's a bunch of like tiny garage looking things and when people have stuff that they don't want to throw away but they don't have room for in their house or apartment they rent one of those things like by the month or by the year to store their junk very wealthy people do that too but they do it in a much more sophisticated expensive manner Free ports are super secure warehouses for the collections of millionaires and billionaires. This isn't just art. It's not just Picasso. It could be straight up bricks of gold. It could be gold ingots. It could be vintage Ferraris. It could be crazy expensive wine. Uh, these things are found in countries where you would expect a lot of uh, very wealthy people to store very expensive things. Switzerland, Luxembourg, Singapore, uh, and it's very advantageous to you if you want to avoid paying the government anything because those goods, when they're stored in a free port, they're technically still in transit. So yeah. it's kind it's kind of like they told FedEx to say, just tell me it's always on the way. Yeah, it hasn't <laughs> quite arrived in the UK yet, so you don't have to pay those taxes. Hmm, when it was being shipped from the U.S., well, it's just whatever, it's in transit. Yeah, a while back, The Economist reported that uh, the free port near the Geneva airport, just on its own, is suspected to hold the equivalent of $100 billion U.S. dollars in art. So not counting the Ferraris, nor the wine, nor the ingots of gold and platinum. Uh, this stuff can be stored years, decades, there's really not a time limit. There's one other neat function of free ports that we have to throw in. Once something is inside the free port, 
Like, let's say a piece of art is inside the Freeport, uh, a Ben Bolin original. I make a lot of art, but I don't sell it. Uh, let's say somehow it ends up in a Freeport. That art can be sold privately and anonymously to other buyers, and it never has to leave the warehouse. They're just trading money using that thing as, you know, sort of to Mad Lib in uh, what they're buying. Whoa. So you that can. Feels like a, yeah, that feels like a good way. You can't really clean money that way, but it's de- that's a weird thing. Well, you you can in some ways. Anyways, okay. Okay. Uh, Doctor Doom compares this to the role that Swiss banks used to play. Uh, he told CNN, "You know, they're an alternative." He said, "Maybe an alternative is just to buy an expensive piece of art and hide it in a free port in Europe. Nobody knows what it is. That becomes the equivalent of a safe deposit in a bank previously in Switzerland." The other thing is. No one is sure about the extent of this problem, even the people making money off of it. Think about it. No one knows the origin of the dirty money. It could be drug money. It could be financial crimes, robberies, trafficking profits, you name it. Also, no one's sure how often it happens, and no one is sure how deep it goes. It's definitely weapon sales, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, the NYT, New York Times, has ran a story earlier this year about... Uh, a very surprising case that you can read right now if you've got enough free New York Times articles, <laughs> or uh, which I had I had one left. Yeah. yeah, you can't get a subscription if you want to. Um, but I was able to read this. There's uh, an accused drug dealer. His name was Ron- Ronald Bellicchiano, and he was in Philadelphia, and the feds raided his house. They found, you know, The things that you would find of a suspected drug dealer, if they are in fact a drug dealer, lots and lots of marijuana. They found about $2.5 million hidden in a compartment beneath a fish tank, which you can see a picture of. It just looks like a box, and it had cash stuffed in it with an aquarium on top of it. Uh, But here's the other thing. They found art, real art, like expensive, fine art. A whole cache of it. Yeah, they did at a storage unit, not a free port, just like a regular public storage unit. Uh, just a few miles away from his house, they found 33 paintings stacked up. Uh, they also found 14 paintings in his home. This wasn't from like his kids' high school painting class. This is stuff like Renoir, Picasso, Salvador Dali, and Belciano had used the art to launder some of his drug cash. He purchased the works from this gallery near Philadelphia's Museum Row. It's a solid operation, basically, until it isn't. And the NYT sums it up by saying buyers typically have no idea where the work they're purchasing is coming from. Sellers are in the dark about where work is going. None of the purchasing requires the filing of paperwork that would allow regulators to track art sales or profits. It's distinctly different from the way the government can review the transfer of other assets like stocks or real estate. But now we need to talk about the other thing. And I think it's something people in the audience were anticipating. Power is not always limited to money. Money is just a a medium of exchange for power. It's a coupon system. It's symbolic. The fine art market has also been seen as a way to peddle political influence. And the most notable accusation in the West uh, in recent years for this kind of thing centers on the administration of current U.S. President Joe Biden. Well, kind of on him, mainly on his son. Yes, Hunter. Hunter Biden, that you've likely heard a lot about over the past few years. Uh, he's he's attained something that many artists have not. Uh, a level of fame, a level of success that, that many can only dream of. He's represented by the ultra-powerful Georges Berge, or B-E-R-G-E-S gallery. In, that's in New York, Ben? Yes, yeah, that's in New York. And uh, he has his works, his art is expected to cost anywhere from $75,000 to $500,000. Again, Hunter Biden, son of the current president. Right, right. And experts, not just political opponents, have raised ethical concerns here. They're arguing that people might not be paying this much just because they like the art. 
they may be doing this because supporting Hunter Biden might establish a line of communication and influence with his father, who is currently one of the most powerful people on the planet. In, in fact, you know, I found one prominent critic, Walter Schaub, because I, I wanted to make sure that the ethical concerns weren't just like, you know, politically motivated stuff. So uh, Walter Schaub was an interesting critic of this to me because back in the day, he was actually the director of the Office of Government Ethics under the Obama administration. So you can, you know, make a, a, some assumptions about his own political leanings. And he said, I find it deeply troubling. We've got a family member clearly trading on his father's name. The man has never sold a piece of art before, has never even juried in a community center art show, but suddenly he's selling art at fantastical prices. There's simply no way anybody paid 75 grand for anything other than his name. That Ooh. sounds kind of cold. And uh, in his defense, Hunter Biden did appear on a couple of outlets. Uh, he was on an art podcast a while back where he said, you know, he was surprised, but he was happy. Uh, he said, I would, you know, be happy if it sold for $10. So painting was a way for him to personally find solace, which is something a lot of painters in the crowd today can agree with. Uh, yeah, but in this yeah. case, you can't argue with the fact that the reason it's that expensive is because of who he is. Uh, I mean, it's that it's that it's that value that's placed upon the art by the outside, right? And when he's represented by a, a powerful gallery, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it definitely has to play at least some role in the success here, partially because when people are buying a name, they're they're also buying a story, right? When you buy when you buy art, you're also buying the story of the person who made it, the story of uh, how it traveled from s someone's mind through all the these various adventures to you. So, yeah, it, it's not a crime. It's just ethically unsound to a lot of critics. And really, it's not a crime because the legal system doesn't have the vocabulary to articulate this as a criminal offense. But that doesn't make it not shady. The problem of money laundering is only set to continue, to grow, to expand. At least that's what multiple governments assume. We're going to pause for another word from our sponsors, and then we'll return to explore a little bit about how these institutions are at least saying they're going to fight back. <laughs> 